Okay. So uh, the uh, presentation today about ammonia emissions from gasoline vehicles uh, using on-road emission test. And uh, this project is um, done in cooperation with the Utah State University and Weber State University. Uh, Dr. Randy Martin from USU, myself, Motasim from USU, uh, Joe Thomas, Dr. Joan Sol, and Samuel from Weber State University. And the project is funded by Utah, uh, the Utah Department of Environmental Equality. Uh, so what was the research, the research motivation for us is that, as we all know, that the Wasatch Front is known for the high concentration of PM2.5. And uh, most of these particles are made of ammonium nitrate, as many studies uh, indicated, like for this, the Wafaku study. Uh, they mentioned that uh, in a bad winter day, up to 70% of the airborne particles, uh, particulates are made of uh, ammonium nitrate. So we have to uh, know where the ammonia is coming from, especially from the uh, human uh, side, not the environment. So we have these equations that show how ammonia uh, contribute to the formation of uh, the particles, the ammonium nitrate and uh, the uh, ammonium sulfate down here. So uh, as uh, we all know that uh, starting from uh, 1981, gasoline vehicles started to be fitted with the catalytic converters to help reduce the emission of carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, and oxygen nitrogen. And these are just a small canisters <coughs> coated with the surfaces. They have a, a very large surface area. And these surfaces are coated with uh, rare metals like the platinum, palladium, and rhodium. And again, these are mainly used to help control the emission of CO, hydrocarbons, and NOx emissions from gasoline motor vehicles. Did it help? Yes. Like sometimes the reduction would be over 99% of, of these uh, pollutants. So the others, the, the uh, side effect of this uh, canisters are they produce the ammonia. They cause the production of ammonia over their surfaces. And the, uh, b before the three-way catalytic converters, the gasoline vehicles were fitted with the oxidation. It was two ways, just oxidizing CO and hydrocarbons into CO2 and water. This was uh, in uh, 1975, but after uh, five years and nine, or six years in 1981, they replaced that with the three-way catalytic converters, which has an additional advantage of reducing the NOx emissions into nitrogen and that's why it's a three-way, it's the three uh, pollutants being uh, controlled. Uh, this is, uh, this graph or this uh, bar chart shows that uh, many studies in the past confirmed that uh, gasoline motor vehicles started to be uh, a, a significant contributor to the atmospheric ammonia. I just want to highlight that here, this study is 1983 was done when only less than 10% of the in-road vehicles were fitted with the catalytic converters. But after that, all the, all the gasoline vehicle, all, all these studies reported uh, that the uh, gasoline vehicles fitted with, the, uh, with these catalytic converters was more than 90%. And that's why we could see that all of them are reporting higher concentration of ammonia as compared with this one. So what we are going to do, since other people tested ammonia, what's the new about our, our research? We're using, uh, we are assessing the ammonia emission from gasoline uh, motor vehicles using on-road emission test, not tunnel or not on, on dyno. We are, we are quibbing the, uh, the vehicles we test with a portable emission uh, monitoring systems and we drive on, a, on, on road and we measure how much ammonia is being formed. And uh, our methodology starting with the how did we uh, chose uh, or uh, pick our uh, sampling aid and this is something also uh, good for this study because other people, most of them, they try to have the, uh, to replicate the on-road vehicles using uh, light duty truck, passenger car or vans. But here we did use the tier, the tier level to have our uh, sample. And this graph shows exactly what we did. We had the distribution of uh, on-road vehicles and we had our sample, uh, the distribution of our sample has the same the same tier level distribution, both of them, the on-road and the test sample. As we could see here, the, the blue, the, the, the yellow, the yellow bars are the, our test, uh, our vehicle test fleet. And the green one is the uh, real on-road gasoline vehicles. 
And we did this, we chose the tier level because the EPA, when they formulate a new emission standards, they always assign it to a tier level. They don't go with the size of the vehicle. They just go with the tier level. And that's why we chose the tier level to replicate the local distribution of the Wasatch Front gasoline motor vehicles. As I mentioned, we have our instruments on board vehicles and we drive, and this is uh, and this is our route. It's a start here at the Utah Water Research Laboratory here in Logan City, and we drive all the way down till we till we hit our first stop sign, second stop sign, traffic light, another stop sign, a traffic line, a school zone with the reduced speed, a traffic light, and all the way back till we come back to our start point. And I just want to highlight that. The uh, legend shows that we have different speeds. We have 25, 25 miles per hour, we have 40 miles per hour, and we have 45 miles per hour. And the same also we had, uh, we have for our route different uh, grades. So we have here downhill 1%, we have here uphill 5.6% and so on. So we're trying to replicate the real world. And the total length for the route is 5.3. As I mentioned, we have different speeds. We have, we have uphill and downhill. We have uh, three traffic lights, two four-way stop signs, and one two-way stop sign. We have school zone. We have uh, many uh, uh, pedestrian crossings. And we allow the driver, or we ask the drivers to follow the uh, traffic rules and not to violate them when we, when we have the tests. Uh, for our instruments, we, as I mentioned, they are portable, so we carry them in, on board. We have two. We have the ECM mini pins for ammonia mainly, and we have the five gas to measure the other gases like CO, CO2, oxygen, hydrocarbons, and NOx. And here we have the setup in the left picture where we have all the sensors inserted inside the tailpipe. And uh, part of it was inserted into the atmosphere to avoid the ambient uh, or the background concentration of ammonia and these gases. And here in the right picture, we see the instrument themselves on the vehicles. And again, we measured the uh, CO, NOx, and hydrocarbons, and we measured temperature, we measured RPM, we measured the location, we measured many things in this, uh, for this project. So with our uh, results, uh, the first graph here shows that uh, we classified the vehicles based on their tier level. And we had this box of block showing the, the ammonia uh, emission ratio from each tier level vehicle. So this one is tier zero uh, vehicles. This one uh, between 19, uh, uh, this one after the 1982 and after the CAT was equipped in, in, in gasoline vehicles. We have tier zero, tier one, and LV and tier two and tier three. And we could see the general trend that older vehicles like tier zero and tier one have higher emission rates of ammonia as compared with the uh, newer cars like tier two and tier three. And uh, the mean uh, ammonia average emission rate as a function of vehicles emission technology where tier zero is 440, tier one, 119.7, uh, uh, tier uh, an LV was 156 until we go to tier three, 9.53. Again, it's just like, it's going down as we, uh, as we uh, go uh, with the newer vehicles. The ANOVA here shows that the significant between these uh, uh, groups are significant. So not all vehicles emit the same, older vehicles emit or a significantly higher emission rate of ammonia than in newer vehicles. The, Second, here, uh, this shows us the, uh, we try to figure out why the, why we have this pattern, why older cars emit higher emissions uh, of ammonia than newer cars. So we looked at CO, post-cast, uh, post-cat emissions, NOx, CO2, and mileage, and we could find uh, that the same trend was the, uh, is the same for the ammonia, like for tier zero, tier one are higher, than tier two and tier three. So we could not, this is, this is also from literature that CO and NOx should indicate uh, the ammonia emission into from, from gasoline vehicles. The mileage itself, it just like shows you, or it could be like an indication of the age of the cat you have, because like older cars in generally, they have higher mileage than in, uh, than in newer cars. And CO2, we just, 
uh, had it here because like we think it could indicate that uh, it could indicate the concentration of, of a pre-cat uh, CO concentration. If it's higher, we would expect higher CO2, higher post-cat CO2 concentration. So from this, we, we, we conclude that uh, having higher CO NOx or CO2 or even mileage would increase the emission rate of ammonia. Uh, the third slide here, we are just uh, showing the entire fleet, what was the, um, the ammonia emission rate from the entire fleet. And when I say the entire fleet, we had uh, 47 vehicles and we tested them in a triplicate. So that's, why, that's a 145 test on, on road test. So here we could see that most ammonia emissions were low, less than 100 may, uh, milligrams per mile, where only few were higher than that. And the box of blood here shows the same. The, uh, the box of blood in the left side is the same as the right side, but we did not, did not display the, the extreme values, not the outliers, just to have better uh, visualization of the data. And again here, most of, the, most of the emission rates were low except for only four were reported as extreme values. And we're gonna uh, comment on that in the next slide or in the, next, in the slide after. So here just we're, we're comparing our start, our uh, outcomes with, the, uh, with other people. And we could say it's on the, somewhere in the average, some people reported 151, some people reported 21. And this is mainly due to differences in methodology, differences in the vehicle characteristics they have, different fuel type, different driving behavior. There are many factors play a role in this uh, graph. And again, when we did the statistical analysis, the ANOVA, the difference was not significant, which, mean, which indicates that our outcomes are inconsistent with, other, with, others people, with other people's work. So here we comment about having the extreme values, as I mentioned, and um, I, do, I know that it's uh, realistically we cannot remove or we cannot ask people not to drive their cars on road. But if we would assume that we could we could uh, limit the number of tier zero and LV tier one, those are the the tier levels that had the extreme values, which only represent twenty three percent of our on road vehicles of fleet, if we remove those or, or we limit the number of those vehicles on road, this would reduce the mean, amo mean ammonia emission rate from the Wasatch front from 62 milligrams per mile to 39.3, which is like almost 30 or like 36.5 uh, reduction. Just removing 20% of your gasoline fleet will cause on like 35 reduction in ammonia, which is Good. If we compare the outcomes of our study to the, oh, oh sorry, if we calculate how much um, emissions we would have if we assume that our calculations are right and it applies to the on-road uh, vehicles of of the West Coast Front, we had uh, the uh, the uh, the Utah Depart the U.S. Department of Transportation Federal Highway Administration. They mentioned that in Utah, on average, the people who drive their cars thirteen thousand eight hundred and eighty-four miles per year. And this would yield on average 1,572 metric tons per year. This is uh, roughly estimation. If we just divide by six, 365 days, we would have 4.3 tons of ammonia every day from the West Asia front gasoline motor vehicles. If we compare this number to the inventory we have here, and I compared with the 2014 because it's published, I know we have the newer one. Uh, and, and they, they're, they're almost the same. The numbers are from the 2014 and 2017, they're all, almost the same, they're close. And uh, my point here is like, we estimated 4.3 tons of ammonia every day. So we measured this. We did not estimate that. We measured this, uh, this is an actual measurement number, 4.3 tons of ammonia every day from the entire gasoline fleet. The 2014 National Emission Inventory estimated 2.3 tons of ammonia every, uh, every day, which is like our estimation almost double what the inventory uh, studies is it, is it something weird? No, there are tons of studies out there. That they're reporting the same thing. When the government they uh, give, or when they make the estimation, they use some models to do this. And always when they when other people did the actual measurement, they would estimate higher than what these uh, what those emission uh, inventories uh, report. 
Uh, the uh, other thing I want to show, we did correlation, as I mentioned, like we have uh, 40, 47 vehicles. We tested 47 vehicles here, and we have the correlation with the vehicle characteristics and exhaust gas, other exhaust gases. So uh, just very quick, we could have, we could see that the mileage, the engine displacement, the year, model year, and the cylinder, those are the main vehicles characteristic that affected or that had significant correlation with ammonia emission rates. The gross weight of the vehicle did not have to, did, did not have any correlate, or it had weak correlation with the ammonia uh, emission rate. For the other gases, and I'm almost done, we have NOx, CO, hydrocarbons, and CO2. So the only one that, that had uh, weak correlation is the hydrocarbons, the post, post cat hydrocarbons. The other parameters had uh, good correlation. And uh, running into conclusions, uh, we've done, as I mentioned, 145 on-road real driving emission test on the, uh, to estimate the ammonia from the on-road gasoline vehicles along the Wasatch Front. The average emission rate for uh, the vehicles were, uh, was 62 milligrams per mile. Uh, general, generally, older motor vehicles have higher emission rates of ammonia than in newer vehicles. And uh, gasoline motor vehicles in the West Front emit higher rates of exhaust ammonia emissions than what inventory studies estimate. And thank you. Perfect timing, Morasem. And thanks for a great talk. Yeah. Who has questions? I'm curious if the, the tier level of the fuel that was used during this, was it tier two or tier three fuel? And would you expect to see uh, differences as well based upon the tier of the fuel levels? So we, we, we to be honest, like, like, like we did, uh, we measured or like we, uh, we recorded the, the, characteristic, the vehicle characteristic, everything, cylinder, engine size, vehicle weight. Uh, we did the other gases, but fuel, no, we did not study or we did not pay attention or we did not ask the drivers to fill some kind of fuel. So we just have the cars and we did not, even we, we didn't know what, what kind of fuels they used. So, but other, other, other studies, I think they have something about fuel. And sometimes some, some of them, they might report some changes on ammonia emission rates based on the, uh, especially for uh, like, this is very known like sulfur content in the fuel, it affects really the ammonia emission rates, how much sulfur in the fuel. I know it's like the regulations are pushing to reduce that, uh, the concentration of sulfur, but yeah, <clears throat> it might affect, but for a study, we did not, we did not include that. What are some would it be, do you think that if you replace the catalytic converter in an older car, would that significantly reduce the emissions? Is it just, is the, is the age in the, in a tier level, is that just an indicator that the catalytic converter has been used up and then if we yeah. just put a new one in, it'd be okay? Yeah, so, so some people, some people like, uh, they say that uh, after 100,000 miles, you have to change your cat anyway, because it would be not efficient as, as, as it's supposed to be. The EPA, even the EPA, when they spoke about this, they would say if it's maintained uh, efficiently, the, it would still be working, but you can't know. So, and, and that's why, and that's why I think one of the things we have to um, do the emission test every time we register, because they want to make sure that your cat is still working. So I think having a newer cat will reduce the ammonia because the <clears throat> ammonia is mainly formed because of a reduction of NOx and a newer cat, they would do th this less than older cars or like high, uh, high mileage cars, let's say. Mutasim, can you talk, tell us about, uh, you, you talked about how your estimate of ammonia emissions on the Wasatch Front is higher than the inventory. How does that compare to other sources, especially agricultural sources and things like that? Okay, so as I mentioned, like the, the, the ammonia problem, we start seeing this problem just after the installation of CAT on, in, in gasoline vehicles. So before 1981, no one was paying attention. No one is, was reporting any ammonia from gasoline vehicles. And it was insignificant. No one was paying attention to it. But after that, it started to be increased because of the CAT and because of the increased number of vehicles on road. So now in most places, and even here in the Wasatch Front, and I did, not mention, I did not mention this in here, but it comes number two after the area sources. So it started to be very significant here. 
in the Wasatch Front and everyone else reporting that it was not significant, but nowadays it's, it could be number two. Even in California, where the leaders in this kind of uh, studies, ammonia and this kind of stuff, they now say that it's number two after uh, area sources. Interesting. Uh, we have time for one more question. Hi, um, did you uh, also do, were these, did the test show include a cold start? No, we did not do a cold start. But from other studies, we know that the ammonia won't start forming till like 150 or 200 seconds because the once the cat reaches the optimum temperature or the stability, like it, it reached the temperature, uh, start working at, then the ammonia would be would start uh, forming. So for, for the first 150, 200 seconds, you won't see ammonia. And this is well documented in many and in, in lots of studies. Because the cat, it, it, the, the cat doesn't start working once we, st we once we turn the switch on. No, it needs roughly 150 seconds to warm up first, and then it will start working. And here, when it starts working, we could see ammonia. Great. Thanks so much, Motasim. Yeah.